Well, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I, you know, the title of my talk kind of says it all, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and make a case in 20 minutes or so that we desperately need a merger of education and work. And yes, I mean this literally and pedagogically. And I'll talk about a number of the ways that, uh, that I think about that. But because this is a STEM conference, I'm sure everybody loves numbers, right? So I'm going to throw out some numbers real quick that I want you to hold in your head for a second. Number one, number one, 98, 13, 11, and double-double, right? So I'm going to tell you what, uh, why those numbers are important. But number one, 98, 13, 11, and double-double. Before I tell you about those numbers, uh, I want to share a, a bit of a, uh, a story about my own experience with this. So long before I got involved in extensive research that I was involved in leading at Gallup, where I was for about seven years prior to uh, my relatively new job at Kaplan, which I've been in for the last year, um, you know, all of us, of course, have our own personal experiences in education. And I just want you to think right now, reflect for yourself, think back to the most memorable and important learning experience that you had in your lifetime. Right? Just start to think about that. This could be an example from high school, it could be an example from college, it could be an example outside of those, those dimensions, right? But, but think back to a really memorable learning moment and experience. I want you to kind of think about why it was that, right? What it helped you accomplish or kind of understand or discover the people that were most likely involved in making that happen for you. Uh, and I'm going to share my most memorable uh, learning experience, and I want to use it as an illustration of the research that I'm going to share with you briefly. But So go back. I just, I just had, uh, hard to believe, for me at least, my 20th uh, college reunion this past spring. I feel like that was only about seven or eight years ago, but it's been 20. And uh, so this is a story from maybe 22 years ago. So I was, at the time, I was uh, class president, which sounds like an awesome role to have on a college or university campus, right? And obviously, cool thing to put on your resume. Uh, it was uh, a really, really difficult job because at the time, uh, this was at Duke University, we were going through uh, a real challenge around how students celebrated basketball victories. This was the big issue of the day at Duke University, right? Which sounds pretty silly in the grand scheme of important issues in the world. But, but for whatever reason, there had become a tradition. Now, when I say tradition, this was like seven years worth of tradition, not 150 years worth of tradition, where students would take wooden benches from across campus. So after Duke would win a Final Four, they would, or a national championship, they would take these massive wooden benches, right? Twice the distance of these tables, and carry them into a quad, put them in a huge pile, and create a massive and very illegal bonfire. And for whatever reason, the university had kind of let this happen. Well, of course, you can imagine all the incredible and horrible things that are happening. These are students who, many of them are under the influence of alcohol while this is going on, pouring things like gasoline on top of these benches, lighting them up. There were horrific burns, injuries. It was very, very fortunate that no one died in these situations. But anyway, I got embroiled in this conversation with the administrators and student leaders about what to do about this. And I wish I hadn't done this at the time, but in a, on a whim in the middle of a meeting with administrators and student leaders, I said, well, we need to come up with an alternative celebration, right, to kind of, you know, move off of this idea of burning benches. And so I'm going to truncate this story, but... You can't imagine the uh, unbelievable angst that was caused as a result of what I thought was just a simple suggestion of, hey, let's have an alternative party. Now, my idea at the time might not have been the greatest idea, but I decided that I was going to uh, plan the world's largest foam party. On the qu Anybody ever been to a foam party, by the way? Okay, there's a couple of you out there. I thought, hey, you know, it's like fire retardant, so start there, right? And, you know, it would be a big scene and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, anyway, the heat that started to come down. So, so it's hard to describe this situation, but uh, it culminated with things like someone kicking in the side, of, uh, the, the side door of my car. 
I got, uh, this is back in the day when you had answering machines. I actually had a death threat from a Duke student on my answering machine, which I didn't really take very seriously. But of course, you know, this drunken, I'm going to kill you, busted. So technically it was a death threat. Um, and I actually got a phone call, this is the amazing part, from a Duke parent at the time who looked up my phone number in the Duke directory and called me to tell me that I was taking away her son's fun at school. Like, can you imagine? Okay, so to say I was unpopular in this moment is an understatement, right? Now, here's why I bring this up. At the same time that I was going through this very, very challenging leadership hurdle, I was taking two classes one with Professor Alma Blunt and one with Tony Brown. Uh, one was on exercising leadership without authority. It was about how do you lead when you're not in an actual position of authority. And believe me, if you know student leadership, being a class president means you have absolutely no authority. You have a title, but you have absolutely no authority. And the other one uh, was actually a class that pulled on uh, Shakespeare to study examples in leadership. And here's my simple point. If I had taken those two classes without having been in the real time lived experience of these leadership challenges as a student leader, I would have missed so much of the value that those classes brought to me. And vice versa, right? If I had just been going through this leadership challenge without the context of thinking about how I step back and study the situation, I still remember some of the techniques in, in, in one of the classes. It was called going to the balcony. And the idea is a visualization of you're in the heat of these moments, right, on the dance floor, and you can't really see what's going on, but you have to extract yourself and go to the balcony and observe what's happening, including what's happening with you. I share this example because it is, it is a poignant moment in my development that only happened because I had the real experience happening in real time with the theoretical, academic, educational component. And there's no doubt in my mind that if I had had one without the other, it would have been a totally different experience and outcome. So now, go back to these numbers that I threw out there. Number one, 98, 13, 11, and double-double. The number one reason why Americans value higher education, there is not a close second place the number one reason is to get a good job. Now, it's not the only reason why we value higher education. I want to be clear about that. But it is by far the number one reason. And it doesn't matter who you ask this question of. All ages, all races, socioeconomic status, right? It is, it is literally at the top of the list. Now, the other number one that goes with that number one is that right now, the biggest critique, the biggest consistent critique about higher ed, if you take out some of the political polarization that has started to arise, is the belief that college graduates are not ready for work. Okay, so this is, like, there's actually differences in views of higher education, as many of you know, between Republicans and Democrats right now. Democrats, if they're negative about it, it's mainly because it's too expensive. Republicans, if they're negative about it, it's mainly because they feel it's too liberal. But if you take out these partisan splits and you just say, okay, what's kind of bothering all of us about higher ed? It's we don't feel graduates are ready for work. Yet, you go back to the number one reason why we value it, it's to get a good job or a better job, right? So you kind of have to wrestle with these things. Now, the 98, 13, 11, what is that? Well, 98% of provosts, the chief academic officers of colleges and universities, say they're doing a good job preparing students for success in the workplace. It's virtually all of them. What's the 13? 13% is the percent of US adults who strongly agree college graduates are well prepared for success in the workplace. And 11 is the percent of C-level business executives who feel college graduates have the skills necessary to fill the roles they're trying to fill. There's a little bit of a gap here, as I hope you all can detect. And it's an important one because 
There are some real issues that are creating that gap. There are some perception and what I might call framing and language issues. I'll just give you a quick example. Critical thinking. Everybody agrees we want students to be critical thinkers. But if you've ever done focus groups with executives in organizations and you ask them what does critical thinking mean, and then you were to do separate focus groups with academic leaders from college universities, they have very different definitions of this thing we call critical thinking. We've actually not done a very good job defining that because I could put critical thinking, you know, that's a big umbrella if you really want to think about that carefully. You know, critical thinking in an academic sense would be uh, somebody's going to defend their doctoral dissertation and your job is to just rip it to shreds. Now, that's a version of critical thinking, right? Poke holes in an idea and a theory, and that has great application in the workplace. But a lot of times when you talk to folks in the employment side of things, they're talking about problem solving, original thinking, coming up with a new idea, new way around things. It's not tearing down an idea. And I don't want to sound too critical about critical thinking. I'm just illustrating the point here that even things we agree to, that we rush to agree to between academ academia and, and employers, for example, if you start to get under the hood a little bit, you realize we're actually, we're actually not all in agreement about critical thinking. There's all kinds of derivatives of that. So, okay, you say, all right, uh, if the number one reason is to uh, get a good job, and most people other than chief academic officers don't feel we're doing a, a very good job at that, Let's go back to these most memorable, important learning experiences, right? The one that I shared, the one that you're thinking about in your own head. I became very interested. First of all, I'm a huge fan of higher education. I've spent my whole career in and around higher education. I'm sure many of you uh, feel the same way in terms of uh, thinking about it as one of the most valuable assets our country has. That said, it doesn't mean we can't be critical of it. And I've always been fascinated with the question of what is it about college that makes it magic? Right? We know that if it works well, it doesn't always work well for everybody, and it's still holding a lot of people back, but when it does work well, there's magic involved. Right? And you've seen the economic data, right? It, you know, those who get a bachelor's degree make a million dollars more in their lifetime than folks who have only a high school diploma. I mean, there's all kinds of elements that are truly magical if we think about those differences. But what I wanted to really understand was what is it about it that makes it magical. Like, for example, is it the buildings on campus and the number of, uh, you know, food service options that are available? Is it about how, you know, finely tuned the, the grass is in terms of how well manicured the grounds are? Is it about the climbing walls or, uh, I don't know, the busing services that are available, right? Is it about the size of endowments? Is it about the reputational value of universities according to high school guidance counselors, which, by the way, accounts for a significant percentage of the weighting in U.S. News and World Report rankings of colleges and universities, if you didn't know that. You can think about the value from a whole bunch of different perspectives. Here's the study that, here's the highlights of the study I was involved with, uh, which was uh, the Gallup-Purdue Index, which first launched in 2014. We looked at the degree to which graduates were engaged in their work later in life and thriving in their overall well-being. Yes, we looked at things like earnings and employment and some of the other metrics, but the reason why I like those two things is that they really kind of elevate that beyond some numbers that are actually kind of tricky to deal with. Like, so for example, if I've got a great school of education, it's obvious that the earnings, the average earnings of those graduates are not going to be as good as if I'm a school that's entirely focused on, for example, STEM degrees. Because there's just differences in earnings. That doesn't mean I'm an institution that hasn't done a good job training teachers, but so here's my point. Yeah, yeah I want to look at things like income and employment and certain aspects like that, but those measures start to mask other qualitative aspects, like, for example, a great education school teaching teachers who are just going into a field that they make less money, right? So this idea of are they engaged in their work, are they thriving in their overall well-being was what we anchored the study around. And what we were really looking for, well, what were the aspects of college that really moved the needle on those outcomes? And here's the quick synthesis of it. There's really two major categories, what I call work-integrated learning and relationship-rich learning. And I want to just quickly highlight examples. So what do I mean by work integrated learning? These were, think, think back to your own experience, right? These were uh, graduates who, who strongly agreed to statements like, 
I had a job or an internship where I applied what I was learning in the classroom. I worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete. Interestingly enough, just to give you an idea of the nuances here, we also asked the question, did you have a paid job during college, yes or no? How many of you had a paid job during college? Just raise your hands real quick. That has no relationship with anything later in life. Now, I'm not saying that wasn't important. You earned money. You were probably able to pay some bills, or right? So like from that perspective, that was, that's exactly right. Buy a book. It was important from that perspective. But in terms of the odds ratios of that making you more or less successful later in life has no relationship. Go back to the question that doubles your odds. So back to the double-double. Doubles the odds that you're engaged in your work and thriving in your well-being was the first one I mentioned. I had a job or an internship where I was able to apply what I was learning in the classroom. That's where the magic is. And if you don't think about how important that nuance is, you could get tricked and go, well, that's the same question. Did you have a paid job during college, yes or no? No, no, they are very different questions. Now, many of you who had that paid job who raised your hands, actually, raise your hand if you feel in that paid job, you were able to apply what you were learning in the classroom. How many of you would raise your hand to that? So about half of those who raised their hand about a paid job feel like they were able to apply the learning. Those are totally different ballgames. Now, I'm not here to suggest that we can make that perfect in every situation, right? But it's, it's also a limitation of our imagination. So if I'm an individual student who gets a job, this was my dad's example. I was using him as cognitive uh, interviewing research. He's, he's 80 now. This is probably when he was 75. I asked him, I said, did you have a paid job during college? He was like, yep, definitely, definitely. Uh, this is how my dad would talk. And, uh, and I said, did you feel like you were able to apply what you were learning in the class? Nope, nope, nope. And I said, well, tell me about that. And he's like, well, I was paving runways, and that's all I did. I just paved runways, and it was really hot, and we just, we just paved runways all day. <laughs> and so we started to get into this bit of a you know, conversation around, well, you know, you were a chemist, right, Dad? You know, he was trained as a chemist. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, so didn't you think about, like, what was the mix of the concrete or the asphalt that you were laying? And he's like, well, I didn't think about that. I mean, here's my point, right? All of us can play a role in curating the connections in these learning experiences, um, and so, uh, as you look at the research, the double-double is, if you had a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete, if you had a job or an internship where you were able to apply what you were learning, on the relationship-rich side of things, it's, I had a mentor who encouraged my goals and dreams. That's a very strongly worded statement. Only two out of ten college graduates strongly agree to that one. If you strongly agree to that one, congratulations. That's the single most important one to hit. But you go, okay, great. That also, by the way, doubles your odds of being engaged in work and thriving your well-being later. So if you take all that away, right, you say, okay, this is why people value higher education. We don't feel like we're doing a very good job at it. What are the magical ingredients that make this thing called education work? It is the merger of work and education. Now, so I'm going to touch briefly on examples of where I see the future going, and the future is actually happening now. By the way, you're, you're seeing these examples in the news all the time. Think about Amazon announcing their, their $700 million education and training initiative. Literally, that $700 million, there is nothing in there that has anything to do with a bachelor's degree, by the way. Just a really interesting point. Now, I'm not saying that Amazon doesn't value people who have bachelor's degrees, but that $700 million training initiative they announced is about things other than a bachelor's degree. Here's some things that we're going to see. Uh, co-ops and credigrees. Most of you know about co-op experiences. Organizations like uh, Northeastern University and Drexel have been doing this for literally 100 years. It is now one of the hottest, most popular aspects in higher education in terms of what students and parents are looking for and what employers are looking to hire out of. These are students who have had an integrated work-learning experience as part of their educational experience, not by chance or accident, right? It's pedagogically designed and woven together. Credigrees, what is that? That's just kind of a blend of two words, degree and credential. And I'm convinced that you're going to see a lot of academic institutions, college universities, who will ensure that their students are leaving not just with a bachelor's degree, but they're also graduating with some form of an industry-recognized credential 
as part of that four-year experience. These are examples where these things can be woven into the current higher education model. And by the way, you can apply this in your thinking to high schools too. Obviously, as you get into kind of middle school and elementary school levels, we're talking about different examples of work integrated learning, but there's ways to mimic work-related environments at all levels of education. Here's another thing that you're going to see. Uh, you're going to see students going pro early. What do I mean by this? This is research that we actually just finished conducting uh, at Kaplan. 56% of current high school students and 74% of current parents, if it were an option, would consider having their student, or they would if we're talking about the student, they would consider going to work full-time directly out of high school for an employer who makes college part of the package. Now think about this. This sounds really subtle, but it's also revolutionary at the same time. Most of us think about going to college to do what? To get a good job. This is going to get a job to get college. College is still valued, but what they see is, number one, they don't want to rack up a lot of student loan debt. Number two, they actually see the value of connecting learning and work. So they actually see this pedagogically as a better pathway, right? Not like I'm learning for four years and then I go to work. It's these things are feeding off of one another. They see the inherent value in that. And they're also, quite frankly, eager to get to work and apply themselves. Now, this isn't for everybody, but you, you, you know, I, the percentages I just shared would tell you that if we crack open the door to these kinds of pathways, if employers crack open this door and, and universities are able to work with them in partnership, this isn't going to be something where a few students walk through that door. This is going to be like a floodgate that opens up. And I can tell you right now, the conversations I've been in with major employers, they are very eager to build these kinds of models. I'll give you a couple reasons. One, they just can't find the talent they need. There are 7.2 million jobs open right now in the United States, which is more jobs open than people unemployed looking for work. It's just not possible, right? I've had conversations with Fortune 500 organizations who have said things like, we now realize we have to create our own workforce. And what they mean is literally grow their own talent. And this starts, by the way, before college. So here's the other thing they say about this, which is really important for all of us to understand. They're all concerned about diversity talent pipeline initiatives. And they have been struggling mightily to figure this out. Most companies are still failing miserably on building more diverse talent pipelines. One of the reasons they're failing, and they're saying this to me in conversations, is because they're only recruiting out of colleges and universities. And by the way, for as much as higher education has worked hard, to increase the college going and college completion rates of underserved minorities in our country, we are still not doing an adequate enough job. And so when these employers go, you know what, we're interested in building more diverse talent pipelines, they're now literally saying that we're no longer going to restrict our thinking to just hiring graduates out of college because college itself winnows down that talent diversity pipeline inherently because of what it is. Now, we also know it's this powerful game changer if we do it right. You know, so can we wrestle with both of these things at the same time? I hope we can. But if you think about this, this is a fundamental shift in how we might all think about education and work. These things now just become combined. Now, let me just throw out some quick stats as a wrap-up. IBM just came up with this great report in about the last two or three weeks that, that estimated there were 120 million workers globally displaced by artificial intelligence. I mean, there's various numbers out there, right? But let's just run with 120 million. That's a lot of people. Um, what's interesting is the shelf life of skills learned is actually getting shorter and shorter, at the same time that the length to train people has increased. So, for example, employers said in 2014, just five years ago, that it estimated it took three days to train the average employee on a new upskilling initiative. This year, they estimate the average time is 36 days. That's gone up 10x in five years. The speed at which this is going is unimaginable, right? In fact, most of our jobs are going to be about how we help humans keep up with the pace of business. 
Like that's literally what our jobs are going to be. And so you go, okay, well, here's another interesting one. This is a report that just came out yesterday, Stroud Education and Gallup work that I was involved with, but it's a report about uh, working adults who don't have college degrees. And it turns out they're twice as likely to turn to their employer for additional education than to go to a college or university for it. Just fascinating points. Like working adults who are thinking about additional training, skilling, whatever, they're thinking primarily about turning to their employer for that as opposed to turning to a university. Now, here's the great point of this. Employers are going to need universities' help in doing this and vice versa, right? So this is about partnership. This is about a merger. It's about a merger literally and figuratively. And if I leave any of you with this, uh, you know, look, we, we can all be part of a campaign to make this happen. Here's my only warning, right? Especially as we think about STEM conferences. Let's not make this a silly either or conversation. Okay, it's not STEM or the broader liberal arts, right? It's not liberal arts versus careerism. These are literally conversations we get into at conferences where even in, in, the, in, in the field, we create this silly dichotomy between these two things. This is not an either or conversation. This is a both and. So this is not about just education or work, this, right? This is about both education and work. And this is going to be true at all ages, across all different industries, right? You name it. We're talking about younger learners. We're talking about older learners and everything in between. But anytime you hear this conversation, oh, by here's another one, soft skills versus hard skills. Anytime you hear liberal arts versus careerism, right? Punch that conversation in the nose, please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you.